G'day, I'm James. Today I have a very fundamental geometry question. This one. Is the composition of two rotations about the origin another rotation? Okay, fair enough. Seems like a fundamental question. In two-dimensional space, you might think, well, the answer is kind of obvious. It's not much of a question. For example, if I take this piece of paper and I regard the center of the paper as the origin, doing a 30-degree rotation, zoom, followed by a 40-degree rotation, actually does seem to be another rotation, namely of 70 degrees. Great, so here in two dimensions, the composition of two rotations does indeed match a third rotation. In fact, I can actually say a bit more. It's commutative. If I did a 40 degree rotation first and then did the 30 degree rotation, I actually get the same result as doing 30 then 40. So rotations about the origin in two dimensional space not only are rotations again, but they're commutative. Grand. Two dimensions, piece of cake. But my question is really about three dimensional space. Are two rotations done about the origin of three-dimensional space combined, sure to give you another rotation. And this question's actually mysterious if you think about it. I'll do an example. I'm going to do it with my arm. I'll do my outstretched arm. I regard my elbow as the origin. My palm is currently facing up. I'm going to do a 90-degree rotation about the origin this way. So forearm up now, palm facing my face. Now I'll do a 90-degree rotation to my, uh, to my left, counterclockwise, zoom. Forearm is now uh, horizontal, palm towards my chest. So I did this rotation, then that rotation. That's two 90 degree rotations. So, I don't know if you can see what happened, but I started this way, and I ended up this way. Is it obvious that there is a single rotation that would have started this way, palm up, and ended this way, palm towards my chest? Now, it's not a 90 degree rotation like that, because the palm's still up. Hmm, is the combination, is the composition of this rotation, followed by that rotation, again, another rotation, less obvious? In fact, right now, I can see there is more structure to worry about here because things are not commutative. First of all, I did a rotation up, up this way across my elbow and then down that way, uh, counterclockwise from my outward direction. What if I reverse those directions? First do the, the counterclockwise rotation this way, zoom, and then do the upward rotation, zoom. So I reverse the order of those two rotations and see my hand and my arm is now in a different final state. So actually the composition of those two rotations was not the same when I changed the order. So things aren't commutative, and now I'm not even sure things are still rotations when you combine them. Hmm. So, my challenge right now, and I'll give the answer away in the next video, is, is there, in fact, a single rotation that starts there and ends there? If so, where is that axis of rotation, and through an what angle did I turn about that axis? Or maybe it's not the case. Maybe, maybe this is not true. Good question. All right, I'm about to give away the answer. So it's not at all obvious to me, and actually it wasn't obvious to Euler either, whether the composition of two rotations in three-dimensional space is actually another rotation. Now, those who know advanced mathematics will say, okay, the space of matrices, SO3, of course, if you multiply two matrices in SO3, you get another matrix in SO3, voila, two, uh, two rotations must be another rotation. But the deep question behind that is, is it obvious that every rotation can indeed be represented by a matrix in SO3? Not immediately obvious. If you start thinking about that deeply, you realize there's a lot to worry about. It's not clear and easy. But nonetheless, as Euler showed, it does turn out to be true. The composition of two rotations is another rotation about the origin. So what rotation, what single rotation gets me from here to here? All right, well, I'll give away the answer. But if you look at the essay that goes with this video, which I'll somehow get the link to it if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm not sure where to link this. Um, well, it goes through the mathematics. I'll actually explain how to get that answer and to prove this result. Um, but here goes. I need a, a rod. So it turns out when I do this to go to there, I've got two directions. I've got this direction. I'm going to end up here. Let's choose the axis that's at that diagonal between my starting and end position. So this is going to be very hard to see. How am I doing on this? Let's go. This way, this way, all right. So I'm going to do the diagonal between this, this outstretched arm and the uh, arm towards my chest, but then I'm going to tilt this down th about 35 degrees. Turns out, coming about 35 degrees from that angle, from that diagonal, is the axis of rotation. If I do a 120 degree rotation about this axis, I'm going to try to do my best I can, uh, trying not to cheat, but I'm really trying to do 180 degrees about that axis. Can you kind of see, it's plausible what I'm saying, that that actually is a single rotation that takes my starting state to the end state. Wow. 
All right, all right. So there's a beautiful way to prove this. You can actually draw diagrams on spheres and watch how spherical triangles move around from rotations to see that actually the composition of two rotations about the origin really must be an or another rotation. But actually seeing it in practice on what you do with the arm is really kind of curious. In fact, actually, I love this arm trick. Go further. Arm out front. Oh, well, you can see it. Probably sit this way. Let's do 90 degrees up, 90 degrees over, and do another 90 degrees, and do it again. Up, over, Again, I just, did, I just did six 90 degree rotations and look what happened to my hand. I started up, I ended up going down. So apparently the composition of these six 90 degree rotations is actually a 180 degree rotation about the original axis of my outstretched arm. Weird, weird and lovely and quirky. Okay, I'm back. Let me try explaining in a video why the composition of two rotations about the origin in three-dimensional space is indeed another rotation about the origin. Okay, so let me, let me think about this. So we'll work with the origin, and let's just look at a sphere whose center is the origin. Then any rotation has an axis of rotation, and will actually rotate that sphere about that axis. So that means for every rotation, there are going to be two antipodal points on the sphere that are fixed in place, where the axis cuts the sphere, and it's going to be a whole big great circle, the great equator, of this rotation, where points slide along that. Now, so that equator is kind of fixed, it doesn't change, but points will actually slide along the equator itself. In fact, the distance each point slides along the equator matches the amount of turning the rotation represents. So I've got a correspondence here for how far things slide on the great equator to go with the, the uh, rotation matches the amount of turning that, that the rotation does. Great, all right, point number one, great. Now I'm gonna think about each rotation has a natural equator to go with it, sliding on that equator corresponds to the rotation. Now I'm going to do this. Suppose I draw three points A, B, C on a sphere. And let me be more general. Let's not talk about rotations right at the moment. Let's just talk about rigid motions in general. That is a motion that keeps distances the same. So rotations are rigid motions. They don't change distances between points. They start a certain distance apart, they'll end the same distance apart. So I'm going to talk about a rigid motion in general for, for right now. And imagine I have a sphere about a center and a rigid motion that keeps the center fixed in place. Then I claim if I choose any three points on the sphere, A, B, C, and make a little triangle, spherical triangle, and see what that rigid motion does to those three points to get to A prime, B prime, C prime, now it will still be on the sphere because if it's a rigid motion, distances from the origin are still fixed, so if they're all the set one distance from the origin, all the images are the same distance from the origin. A spherical triangle is taken to another spherical triangle. If it's taken to a congruent spherical triangle, all the distances stay the same. I claim, once you know what a, what, what's a rigid motion does to one spherical triangle on the sphere, you know everything about that rigid motion. You know what it does to some like weird outside point P. Okay, at least in principle. It'd be hard to calculate, but in principle, you now know what the rigid motion does. You could figure out where that image of P primed of P P primed has to be. Here's how. Here's the reasoning. You can imagine, if you like. If I actually did do the origin, I could actually connect the origin to A, the origin to B, the origin to C, and the origin to P, and P to A, and P to B, to P to C. You get this sort of like six-faced polyhedral thing. And all the distances you know, because I'm assuming I know where A, B, and C are, and I know where O is, and I'm choosing a point P, which I want to know where it is, so and where it goes, so I'm assuming I know where it is to start with. So I've got this polyhedron, and all the possible distances between the points are fixed. And if you know what... O, A prime, B prime, C prime, and P prime are all keeping the same distances. They all have exactly the same measurements as that original polyhedron. You can kind of imagine you've got no choice. There's only one possible place that P prime could be is the one that keeps gives you a congruent polyhedron. All right, a little bit wishy-washy there because maybe there's things that are like collinear here going on. It's a little bit degenerate. Um, another way to argue it, a more precise way perhaps, and it's probably going to be more confusing, which is why I hesitated making this video, is the following. So, O, A, B, and C, O, A prime, B prime, C prime, that's all known. I've got a point P whose distances from four other points is known. I'm saying I know where P is, I want to know where P goes to. But I know what its four distances have to be. I know its distance from O has to be what it was beforehand. So I know P prime is somewhere on a big sphere. I know it's also a fixed distance from A primed. So I'd have a sphere about A primed intersecting a big sphere and P primed has to be on both of them. That gives me a circle of points where P prime could be. I know it's distance from O on some big sphere, it's distance from A, another sphere, 
they intersect in a circle, that gives me a circle of possible locations for P primed. Then I do its distance from B primed is fixed. It matches this distance. So I've got a circle where I know P prime could be intersecting a sphere about its distance from B primed. Well, a circle and a sphere intersect in just two points. So I've now lowered, um, narrowed the possible location of P prime to two places. And I've still got a distance from C prime to play with. And its distance from C prime must match its distance from C initially. That will then pin down which of those two spots is the actual location of P prime. Whoa. So, upshot. If I've got a rigid motion that keeps the origin fixed, and I know what that rigid motion does to a spherical triangle, then in principle, I know that rigid motion entirely. There's only one possible place points can be mapped to that are off that rigid triangle, of that spherical triangle. Great. Another way of saying that is, there is at most one rigid motion that could take a spherical triangle to another place, another given spherical triangle, because that rigid motion is determined what, what's happened there. There's at most one rigid motion that maps a given spherical triangle to another spherical triangle, a congruent one. That's the key point. That's the one that allows me to prove this. There's at most one rigid motion that takes a given spherical triangle to another spherical triangle, at most one. All right, here goes. Let me now prove this. So let's suppose I've got two rotations, now I'll talk about rotations, about the origin. So here's a sphere centered about the origin, and one rotation will have its equator, and another rotation will have its equator, something like this. All right, so let's just say this is the first rotation of turning, and this is the second rotation of turning. In fact, what we do now is map a point P, uh, A here, uh, call that P, and let me do it so it slides along the equator, but let me only do this for half the angle of the rotation. Bit weird right now. You'll see why I chose halves. It came like I went backtracked and figured I had to go back in halves. And then I'll say on the second rotation, P might move here in half the rotation for that second, half the angle for that second rotation. All right. So one rotation about this equator, one rotation about this equator. I happen to choose points on those equators that are half the distance I, I would naturally think to do. What we do now is draw the natural third equator, the one that goes through A and X. So it's something like, uh, I'm not going to do this very well. No, I'll better keep it in the same color, otherwise it gets confusing. So there's another equator. All right. You might guess that equator corresponds to my composition, composite rotation. All right, but here goes. I'm now giving myself a little spherical triangle. What I want to do now is copy that spherical triangle in three places. So it's got one long length, one medium length, and one shorter length. And what I'm going to do now is copy it up here, the other side of P. Uh, the picture's going to be a bit of a mess. So that is, I'll copy this medium length over here, couple of short length over here, and that long length up there. Picture's not very good, I apologize. And do it again. Do it across P, do it across A, and do it across X. So over here, this is going to be a really bad picture, I apologize. Pre-apologies. All right, double prime there, uh, single prime there, triple prime there. So I've now got that one, and then over here, uh-oh, not giving myself much room. There'll be the single prime there, it'll be the triple prime there, and around the corner will be the double primed. Very bad, I'm sorry. That's why I didn't want to make this video, because I'm not very good at drawing these things. So I've got one copy there, one copy there, and one copy that sort of got wrapped around the sphere. Sorry about that. But now I've actually got three congruent copies of that central APX triangle. Now, look at my first, first, uh, rotation, which was this equator here. It actually slides this triangle all the way up to this triangle. You see the double primes, triple primes, and single primes match? And actually, I had to go twice the distance I first drew. That's why I had to halve things at the beginning. The first rotation I did takes this spherical triangle to that position. The second rotation I did is this equator takes this spherical triangle. If I go twice the distance, which is because I did half of them here, uh, triple, single and doubles around the corner, yep, the second rotation takes the spherical triangle over to yonder. So the composite rotation, my first rotation to second rotation takes this spherical triangle zoop, zoop, to that spherical triangle. All right, we found a rigid motion that takes that triangle to that triangle. I don't know if it's a rotation. It's a rigid motion, that's all I can say. However, I do also know that the rotation that I could have done that goes along that new green equator, aha, uh -huh, actually takes this triangle Oops, my lights went out. Cross this way to that triangle. So there's a rotation that actually takes this spherical triangle to this spherical triangle. And earlier I said there's at most one rigid motion that will take a given spherical triangle on a sphere to a, to a different location. Well, it must be then that my composite rigid motion 
is actually that rotation given by that equator by whatever amount of turning that is. The composition of two rotations about the origin must indeed be another rotation about the origin. The matrix group SO3, do I have a proven that's actually closed on the composition? <sighs> Lots of deep thinking here. All right, okay, great, that's it. Now the hard part is, can you actually identify these axes to get this thing? I said it was 45 degrees uh, diagonally down, but then about 35 degrees down. I had to do a little bit of vector calculus to see that. Though I think there could be symmetry argues that you might be able to see that to some good degree in any case. Lots to think about, and wow, isn't that lovely?